Right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the talk. My name is Brendan Lesh, and today I will be discussing the, my master's project on the investigation of surface vibrations in nickel 62 using Coulomb excitation. Rather than any further ado, let's get into it. All right, so I'll just discuss a bit of the outline. So I'll take you to the reasoning and objectives of the study on nickel 62. Um, then we'll talk about some vibrational criteria, which will become relevant in the next slide. And then following there, we'll talk about Coulomb excitation, just a bit on the theory. And then following that, we'll talk about the experimental setup. And then we'll go through the data analysis that I had done and talk a bit about the results. Right, so let's move on to the next slide. All right, so the question on whether or not surface vibrations is a factor in the nuclear charge is the driving point of this study. Um, so this idea came about uh, with Paul Garrett in 2008, and he posed a fundamental question on whether or not the vibrational motion is a factor in uh, the isotope that he was studying, particularly the candium isotopes. And he observed that there seems to be some sort of a breakdown um, with this model. And this is an expansion on that. We're taking a look on another candidate for vibrational motion, which is nickel 62, and asking, uh, asking the question on whether or not the vibrational uh, or surface vibrations is a factor in the uh, a description of motion for the nickel 62 isotope. So in order to do that, we are trying to determine the trinity quadruple moment for nickel 62. And following that, uh, we'll be also be looking at the second zero plus to the first two plus state and finding the matrix elements and the B2 value for this transition. All right, so now we can take a look at the B2 value on the quadrupole moment and what exactly this means. So the B2 value is a representation on whether the state is populated collectively or singularly. And this basically means on whether or not one or multiple particles are excited during, uh, excited to a new state or a, um, a higher state um, by one or multiple particles. And the B2 value is related to the quadrupole moment um, via the equation that is represented on the screen. And the quadrupole moment is another representation of the shape of the nucleus. Now, if we go to the intrinsic quadrupole moment for nickel 62, we seem to see that we have a value of 0 0.03 uh, with an uncertainty of 12. Now, this is a fairly large uncertainty, and I'll make reference to it again a bit later. And following that, we're looking at the B2 value for the first excited state in nickel 62, which was compiled by Protichenko and his team in 2016, which they compiled multiple nuclei on B2 values for the first excited state. And I decided to make a, um, a weighted average on what is to expect of this value. Uh, as you can see, that is the value of the regard, 0 0.0867, and then uncertainty of 30. So what does this have to do with um, vibrations? Uh, that's what I'll discuss next. So the vibrational criteria, um, there's a few, and I'll be going through them a bit just to um, discuss what exact, how, how relevant they are to nickel 60. So one of the I am um, criteria is that the ratio for the 4 plus and 2 plus energies is roughly equal to 2. And you can see that by the 1173 energy and the 2336 energy of the 4 plus and 2 plus states for nickel 62, uh, they, uh, the ratio between them is roughly equal to 2. And then following that, we can see the triple, uh, the triple in the near phonon states have almost degenerate energy. So what that means is that the second zero plus, the second two plus, and the four plus states are roughly equal to each other in terms of energy, not identical, but roughly about equal to each other. Um, next, we're looking at the intrinsic quadrupole moment of the, of the nuclei, in this case, nickel 62, being close to zero. So on the previous slide, we saw that the nickel 62 intrinsic quadrupole moment is 0 0.03, with the uncertainty of 12. And now this uncertainty puts the quadrupole moment to be both negative and positive. 
um, due to the uncertainty and it crosses the, um, the zero value. So we don't exactly know what the shape for nickel C2 is. So it's possible that it could be zero or it could be um, prolate or oblate. And following that, we then have to look at the B2 value for the 4 plus, second 0 plus, and 2 plus, second 2 plus, to the, ground, to the first 2 plus is equal to twice that of the B2 value for the 2 plus, the first 2 plus to the ground state value. So that is another way that we can determine whether or not the, the nucleus is vibrational. And that's what we'll explore um, uh, throughout the, the project. All right, following that, we're just going to look at a bit on the theory for Coulomb excitation. Sure, so what exactly is Coulomb excitation? So Coulomb excitation is a purely electromagnetic interaction with the nuclei, with nuclei, uh, particularly ones that are being scattered off each other. And then it's an inelastic collision in which the transition from the first state to the final state um, uh, occurs due to the energy that is imparted uh, on the projectile onto the target during the inelastic collision. From there, it decays back down to a lower state emitting a gamma ray that can be detected, and th this is what we do during the experiment. Um, so the Coulomb excitation cro differential cross-section is related to the rough with a differential cross-section by the probability, and that can be seen as equation two on the right-hand side. So this probability being the probability that the target, or the beam in our case, are excited through a time-dependent electromagnetic interaction. So as you can see, the probability is calculated using perturbation theory, and that's the solution we get um, right on top. Uh, for the probability. All right, so one of the key factors in Coulomb excitation is the fact that no nuclear forces are invoked during um, the experiment during Coulomb excitation. And one of the things we need to keep in mind when we do Coulomb excitation is making sure that the nuclear force is not invoked. And the way we do this is by following the Klein criterion, which suggests that the nuclear collisions need to be at about five femtometers or more um, away from each other so that no nuclear forces are involved. And we follow the equation I suggested below in order to make sure that this may occur. All right, so let's go follow up that with the experimental setup. So this was the first ever uh, experiment accelerating nickel 62 onto a heavy target of 194 platinum. Um, the soccer ball frame was used uh, with a silicone and germanium detectors for detection of the particle gamma coincidences. And 13 germanium clover detectors were used at various theta and phi angles with five detectors at 135 degrees, five at 45 degrees and three at 90 degrees with respect to the beam. Um, so we had the beam of nickel 62 with a target platinum 194, target thickness for platinum being 1.33 gram centimeter squared, and the target to the silicon de distance is about 3.35 centimeters, target to the germanium detectors, the distance being 30 centimeters, and the beam energy of 237.5 MeV. So now we take a look at the uh, silicon detector, um, the detector that we'll be using to uh, detect the particles. So this detector was used for the nickel 62 particles and were placed at backward angle, backward scattering angle um, during the collision of the target and the projectile. So the detector was split into 24 rings and 32 sectors, and the angular range for the rings, um, angular coverage being 133 degrees to 162 degrees. Alright, so next we move on to the data analysis. So this data analysis was done offline using the sorting program MIDAS and Gremlin, and Gremlin was used particularly for the efficiency calculation. Following that, we looked at the nickel, 60, um, nickel C2 data, which was energy calibrated using the 152 European source. On the left-hand side of um, the picture, that is the source we use to calibrate the energy. And on the right-hand side, we're looking at a particle spectra for rings 1 through to 22 of the silicon detector. Now, we had noticed that two of the rings were not working, and we had to then not use those and follow only through with uh, rings from 1 to 22. All right. 
Uh, following that, we needed to do a calculation for the beta value. Since all, all of the gammas that we had detected using the detectors, the germanium detectors, will need to be Doppler corrected. So in order to do that, we had to use two-body kinematics calculations, and we are, have produced these graphs uh, to do that. Um, following that, we needed to calculate the beta, which is the equation over there. And in order we do this is that we need to de determine what is the energy of the scattered particle, in this case being the projectile for nickel 62, um, and what are the energies that they are scattered at, since we know that our angular range for the particle um, detection is between 133 and 162, we have to then find what the energy is at that particular scattering angle. And that's the main point here. We can also relate the scattering angle for the, the nickel 62 to the platinum, which is a, what a one-to-one -one, um, uh, correspondence, and then find out what is the energy of the platinum scattering uh, in relation to the nickel 62 scattering. And then following that, we can then use that to calculate the energy of the platinum in order to Doppler correct it. And that is what we did. Once we had used the Doppler correction equation, uh, we were able to then Doppler correct both peaks in nickel 62 and in platinum 184. And that is the first two plus state for both platinum and nickel, uh, platinum being a 328 kV and the nickel uh, 1173 kV. Um, respectively, they use beta values of 0.047 and 0.031. Right. Following that, we then had to calculate the angular distribution for both nickel and platinum. And our, once we were done calculating the, the angular distribution, we then had plotted the, the Gauss yields that we had done for both platinum and nickel synthesis to see how well they have fit or how well they overlap with each other in order to give us an idea on whether or not our Gauss um, calculations are doing the correct thing. So that was our, our next objective. And as you can see that the nickel 62 and platinum are fairly in, um, in range with, in, with reference to the uncertainty of each other. All right, so following after that, we then had to look at any of the other peaks that perhaps present themselves in the nickel 62 data. And as you can see, we find that there is another peak for nickel 62, particularly the second two plus state of 2301 kV. And we are still currently looking for any other peaks that perhaps show themselves. We can um, perhaps see a few uh, reference in the, the current um, spectra, but we haven't definitively understood um, a few of their peaks, so that's what we're still looking into. And finally, with our last step, we still have to go through quite a bit of Gaussian calculations to, to determine the, uh, the intensity ratios for the, the platinum and nickel, um, particularly the Gaussian being on the left-hand side does this calculation. And on the right-hand side is what we know as the intensity ratio that we calculate for, um, for, for our data. So the N um, gamma T is basically the, the counts of the gammas for the target uh, divided by the counts of the gammas for the particle. And that is multiplied by the efficiency of the particle at that particular energy and the efficiency of the target. So um, that will be the follow-up for our, our results. And then we will be able to extract the quadruple moment using diagonal matrix elements versus the transitional matrix elements relationship. And then we'll be able to finally interpret what our results mean. Um, yes, and that is um, our pending results going forward. And finally, I'd just like to say thank you to all the collaborators that have worked with me and helped me along the journey. Uh, thank you very much for listening to my talk and yeah, enjoy the rest.